The next talk uh, comes from Matt Ritter. Matt has done substantial work that's informed many of us about the use of simulation and skill acquisition uh, in the laparoscopic realm, and there's some very important lessons learned. So we're going to ask him to talk to us about simulation and skill acquisition. What can we do in the lab, and why should we? Matt. Thank you. Thanks, John. So uh, as John alluded to, uh, most of my work has been done in terms of simulation with laparoscopy, but uh, particularly with the FLS program. But I think uh, we'll transition fairly well to what can be done with FES as it, uh, it continues to roll out. So disclosures, I, uh, I am a military surgeon, so I do get uh, research support from the Henry Jackson Foundation. Um, I, I do wonder when I ride up the escalator in the morning if I need to disclose Ethicon now. I, d I don't know, but <laughs> it's kind of funny. Um, so my goals for this talk uh, first is uh, for you to be able to understand the role of the simulation lab in skills training in general. Uh, and then obviously figure out why spending time in the lab is worthwhile. And then uh, to achieve those goals um, and have a few objectives. So hopefully we'll be able to explain this concept that uh, we talk about, about creating a pre-trained novice in the lab, somebody who's ready to enter the clinical environment. Um, talk about how to apply criterion-based training strategies to abstract simulation platforms like FES. And then discuss a little bit of the results we've had on FLS when we use these strategies for training. So. Whenever people talk about simulation for training, uh, to a large portion of the audience, they, they immediately think about flight simulation, and, and uh, it's kind of been held up as the gold standard uh, for simulation-based training. And, and people uh, envision a, a simulator that looks like this, which is you know, basically the complete recreation of a cockpit where you can do all kinds of advanced um, simulation maneuvers. But the reality of flight simulation is it really started like this. Um, with the old link trainer where you could uh, learn how to use your flaps, learn the basic uh, manipulation techniques. And then over time has kind of advanced through stages to the you know, high complex simulation platforms that we have today. I'd say in terms of uh, surgical simulation, we're probably you know, somewhere in this range depending on the, the exact platform. You know, we're, we're not here and we have to frame those expectations. Those, uh, you know, we have to manage our expectations for what we can produce in terms of surgical simulation with the tools that we have. So at, at that level of simulation, I think what we're, we're trying to create can kind of be uh, uh, illustrated through a, a model of how we use our attentional resources as surgeons. So this is a hypothetical model of a, of a novice surgeon, novice trainee in whatever task you're training, and a, a master surgeon or a master uh, proceduralist. Um, everybody has only so much stuff they can pay attention to at one time. Your, your brain can only work so hard. So it's, it's how you use these attentional resources that really uh, help you get the best bang for your buck from a training standpoint. So if you compare master surgeons and novice surgeons in terms of what they're doing with their hands, if we look at just psychomotor performance, so getting your hands to do what you want them to do, and then, uh, you know, especially in the endoscopic or laparoscopic environment where you're having to judge depth and spatial things that are, that are not uh, inherently easy, you, you get a situation something like this where most of the novice's brain power is taken up by just trying to get their hands to do what they think they want them to do. And you know, this, this line can obviously be variable. There's certainly people who are over this attentional capacity just by these two tasks, and there are some who are naturally better. But a much larger proportion is taken up um, uh, of their attentional resources in the novice. So when you're the person trying to teach these novice surgeons, you, you have to realize that you know, understanding what you're asking them to do and then Getting other small nuances of the procedure, you know, how did you position this patient to get, my, get yourself in this situation? A lot of this stuff that can only right now be done in the clinical environment gets lost because the trainee is spending so much brain power just trying to get their hands to, to work like they'd like. So what we'd like to be able to do with simulation is create a concept of a, a pre-trained novice. So somebody who hits the clinical environment with a little bit of space left over to learn stuff. Okay, so if in the lab you can train out some of this gap in psychomotor performance, spatial judgments, et cetera, the basic core skill set, then you leave this whole area here open 
um, for these other things that right now, at the level of simulation we have for surgical simulation, we can only really train most of this in the clinical environment. But this part, we don't, we don't need. We can get this out in the lab, okay? So this is our goal, this kind of pre-trained novice concept. So when we, we talk about the practicalities of trying to make this happen, and we start looking at simulation platforms that exist, I think most of us that are surgeons or endoscopists in the audience, if we see simulators like these, it's fairly intuitive how you, how you train with those because these are actually simulating clinical uh, things that we do all the time. So, so it's, you can apply the same teaching strategies you use in the, the endoscopy lab or the operating room to simulators like this. Uh, unfortunately, simulators like this come with a fairly high price tag and, and uh, you know, have, have their own technical issues in, in a lot of ways. So the tools that a lot of us end up teaching with are a bit more abstract, okay, than, than those full procedural simulators. But it doesn't necessarily mean that they're, that they're worse. Can you get the audio off on that? Um, so the, the difficulty comes from changing gears as a, as a teacher or as a trainer and understanding how can I train with some of these more abstract tools at my disposal but still get uh, uh, the most bang for my buck to create that pre-trained novice, to not waste my trainee's time but to, to have them enter the clinical environment with the skill set that they need. Okay, luckily we have a precedent from, uh, from Hollywood, right? Uh, in the Karate Kid, Mr. Miyagi got a lot of work done around his house by using fairly abstract training strategies. Now, his end point was just whenever his deck was done or the fence was painted. Um, so we can't really use those, but we can, we can figure out how to use objective endpoints for some of these abstract tasks. So one way to do this is a concept that's, that floats around in the literature by multiple names, proficiency-based training, criterion-based training, et cetera. But this is the core concept. Anybody who's experienced or expert at any type of skill has some you know, measurable, quantifiable amount of skill for that procedure. Any simulator or task trainer, based on its fidelity, is going to be able to measure some percentage of that skill. Uh, it, you know, it's very rarely at the, at the level we're at for simulation, it's very rarely all of that skill, but some percentage. So you can take that measurable percentage and set that as a proficiency level, goal, training goal, et cetera, for your novices, and then allow them to basically train on that abstract simulation until they're performing on that particular platform as well as this expert, okay? They're not gonna be you know, they're not going to represent all the skill set of this expert, but they're going to get as much as they can out of whatever training platform they're using based on its ability to measure expert performance. And the, one of the beauties of this concept is that as the simulation platforms change and improve and progress towards that uh, holy grail flight simulator that we showed, the, the concept doesn't really have to change because as the simulator gets better, it'll just measure more of that expert skill and it's still very useful as a, as a target for your trainees in terms of uh, efficient use of your, um, your training platforms. So, so basically set that proficiency level and have your novices trained to it. So does this type of training work? And, and we've done a fair bit of work like this. Again, most of this is based on work uh, with FLS. So Danny Scott and I set out um, in 2004, pretty soon after FLS was officially released, as, a, as an assessment tool, which you know, it is a, a, a test, uh, an eva evaluation of laparoscopic skill, but you also had to be able to, to train on it. So we wanted to create a training curriculum using these concepts and applying them to FLS. So it's really a pretty straightforward three-step process, determine that desired performance, use the criteria from step one to develop a criterion-based curriculum, and then execute the curriculum and, and see what kind of results. So we'll talk about that here in a second. So in, in order to determine the desired performance level, we did just as I showed. We took a group of experienced uh, laparoscopists who had not done the FLS tasks many times or anything like that and had the, you know, performed all the FLS tasks and collected the data of the uh, experienced surgeon performance. We used those data to create uh, uh, criterion levels for basically each of the five FLS tasks that included times as well as 
what, what degree of error was allowable for each task. And, and you can see some, sometimes we used the average uh, score, sometimes we added a couple standard deviations because we wanted it to be doable. We, weren't, we didn't have a good feel for exactly what was doable at that point. Um, so, but we, we set this out and, and, uh, and created these uh, objective training goals for each of the tasks. And then added in there obviously some uh, assurances that people just didn't luck into this performance, so doing things two consecutive times with some reinforcement or, or something like that. So this was the curriculum, the core of this proficiency-based curriculum that was done for FLS. And then we executed, you know, trying to uh, incorporate all the, the key points of, uh, of good curriculum. Um, they had a pre and a post test. They had some mentored practice to make sure they're going to practice correctly. And then they had distributed sessions with feedback, et cetera, uh, going through each of the tasks until they achieved those goals that were on the last slide. And what you see here briefly is the, the results in terms of, uh, of the FLS test. So this group here, this large scatter, was the pretest, where you can see the, the passing score there. And, and nobody was able to, to pass out of this novice group on the pretest. And then post-test, you see obviously significant improvement, 100% pass rate, and then a, a, a tighter clustering in performance, where here you, know, you have anything from zero up to almost passing. And, and you see a, a lot of key concepts, reduced variability of performance, as well as you know, some of the dots that were down here are now, are now up here. So, so you really uh, kind of reinforce and empower some of these less natural performers into showing that, that they can perform. So in terms of improving on the test, this certainly uh, uh, showed promise. We also looked at follow-up of this. Would this be a durable strategy, or, or, or do you lose these skills quickly? And uh, what you see here, this is the average pretest score. This is immediate post-test, so this is within two weeks of finishing the curriculum. Uh, the yellow is six-month follow-up, and then the, the turquoise or, or whatever is 12-month uh, follow-up. So you see very good retention. And these, again, these were medical students, so they weren't doing any laparoscopy. Um, over that year that they were that they were followed up, so I believe the number in the paper is somewhere between 80 to 90 percent retention um, at a year using this type of strategy. And one of the cool things we also looked at is is in these follow-up groups, we had them do more than one trial just to see how quick or if there was any spontaneous recovery. And what we found is basically by the third trial of each task, and again these are the six-month and 12-month follow-ups. By the third trial. Basically, they were performing at the level uh, of the, uh, the immediate test, so the immediate two-week test. So you had, you know, even though you didn't have much decline, you had very rapid recovery of that skill set to the level uh, that was attained right at the end of training. So at least for a, a year, uh, these, uh, this performance, when you apply this kind of a strategy, is durable. Okay. And then hopefully I'm not going to steal too much of Melina's thunder here. I'm going to mention this briefly, but her group took it the next step and, and, and tied in FLS um, proficiency-based training into the operating room and, uh, and showed with their operative assessment tool that not only did uh, the, the proficiency train group, which is the red here, uh, improve uh, from baseline to after training, but based on their, uh, their goal scores evaluations, that uh, correlated to uh, about a year or so of, of residency training in terms of improvement. You know, so by going through a curriculum that takes seven to nine hours, uh, they're able to get skill quantifiable skill performance improvement uh, equivalent to a year or two of, of uh, residency. So all very good uh, indication that, uh, that this type of training strategy will work uh, for abstract simulation platforms like FLS and FES. Um, as, uh, as it rolls out and becomes available to use. So to tie up, what can we do in the lab? I think with the tools we have available right now, we can definitely create that pre-trained novice, that, that trainee that has the core skill set that makes them ready to enter the clinical environment and learn the stuff that right now can really only be learned in that environment without having to waste time on learning some of the other. Uh, and, uh, and we can do that through those established performance goals, which again, allows you to preserve your, your uh, cherished time on your simulation platform, let people use it who need it more than others. And then why? Because the results are durable and it, and it translates um, into uh, improvements in, in actual clinical training and clinical performance. So uh, I close by saying I was, I'm one of the bad faculty guys who didn't get his uh, syllabus in. Um, I'm fairly recently back from Afghanistan, so most people cut me a little bit of slack. But if you, if you do want any of this stuff, please feel free to, uh, 
to email me and my email's up there and I'd be happy to send you the slides and the, the papers that I talked about. Thank you very much. Thank you, Matt, and I think we will be happy to cut you some slack on that. Thank you for your presentation. Uh, the faculty have done a great job of staying on time. We're actually just slightly ahead of schedule, so let me just take a moment to remind you that uh, listed in your syllabus or your program, the, the overall meeting program, are uh, addresses you can use to Twitter or uh, email uh, questions or comments that you'd like to have us consider for the uh, panel discussion at the end of this panel. 